the impact of divestment was raised. Whatever it is, wouldn't the elimination of government subsidies for fossil fuel exploration and development have much more of an impact? So, would it have greater impact? Fossil fuel subsidies definitely are a huge issue, not just um, for production of fossil fuels we have in this country, but, but actually chiefly for the consumption of fossil fuels, um, which in, mostly in, in major oil producing countries. So just order of magnitude, uh, in 2012, the most recent year for which we have data, governments around the, around the globe spent um, over $500 billion on subsidies for fossil fuels, again, two-thirds of that in oil producing countries in the Middle East, Africa and elsewhere, um, and about $100 billion subsidizing uh, renewable energy. So anytime you hear people, including CEOs of major oil companies, all renewables, they're all, they're all subsidized, uh, it's just, it's one to five, it's not true. So, I mean, you know, you, they're not mutually exclusive, and yes, phasing out um, subsidies of fossil fuels is something that has support really across the political spectrum. I mean, it's not, it's bad for budgets, it's bad for air quality, it's bad for the environment, uh, and definitely any steps that can be taken towards that uh, make a significant contribution to, to curbing global warming. Thank you. Um, I'll just add up real sure, quickly. Okay. Um, so I was meeting with the New York State group of um, the energy plan people for Governor Cuomo, and they were layering out a whole series of, I think, some very good plans for the future in energy. And I said, why aren't we zeroing out New York State tax expenditures for petroleum products? And they said, what's that? I said, well, if you go into the tax expenditure document for the state, there's a whole list of petroleum products that we still give exemptions and abatements and credits for. So I go, if we're supposed to be disincentivizing people from using fossil fuels, it seems to me it sort of needs to be on the list for the New York State Energy Plan for the future um, to stop giving tax loopholes for uses of fossil fuels. So I, I don't think it's one or the other. It's just sort of a, keep going on that list of things we know we can fix. Why wouldn't switching to fossil-free funds have more of an influence now by directly encouraging development of alternative sustainable energy and doing better in the long term to assure returns for pensioners? You know, I, I appreciate the for managing the entire portfolio, uh, we need to pursue risk-adjusted returns. That means spreading out uh, exposure across a variety of uh, uh, investments. Certainly the New York City funds would welcome you know, more opportunities uh, to invest in renewables. Uh, that includes not simply allocating to, uh, uh, to new designated funds, uh, but also pushing the companies currently in our portfolio to, uh, to pursue uh, attractive uh, investments and in shifting uh, their current capital expenditures uh, to a more sustainable business model that would have returns for many uh, centuries, uh, for many decades to come. Uh, an immediate shift uh, to a complete fossil fuel investment portfolio we want to keep in mind that the impact of the fossil fuel companies, however we're defining them, the top 33, the top 200, uh, their current operations are impacting the future profitability of our other uh, companies in the portfolio and of the broader economy as well. So the question is, where can we have the most impact now? Uh, Perhaps fossil uh, fuel uh, free is, is a viable option. Uh, at some point, we can have that discussion and debate. Uh, but we view uh, that if we pulled out immediately, uh, we wouldn't have the opportunity to influence the companies currently in our portfolio to push them towards renewables, uh, to push them for a lower uh, carbon footprint. Uh, and I think as has been pointed out, these companies are not necessarily uh, monolithic. Uh, they have a variety of business strategies within them, uh, and we can uh, urge them to weight lower carbon opportunities more greater than the most uh, crucial and time-pressing uh, investments currently. 
And I would just add a, a couple of things to that. Um, it's also important to think about the scope of the capital expenditures that these companies wield. So some of you may have heard the, the administration's announcement that they were going to invest $3.5 billion um, in a, a green fund for renewable energy. And, um, and that was a great announcement. It's, it's really important. The, but the capital expenditure budget for ExxonMobil alone for one year is $35 billion. Um, so the amount, even shifting a small percentage of a fossil fuel company's capital expenditures from oil to natural gas or from oil to wind or oil to solar can have a huge impact. And for example, Total, which is a, a French-based company, owns a 65% stake in a company called SunPower. They're building one of the largest, or the largest, solar farm in Chile. Uh, they are, they have a goal of tripling their solar panel manufacturing capacity over the next five years. They have very active programs for um, distributing solar lamps uh, in Africa. And then Statoil, and again, these are, you know, there, we are seeing a bit of a divide between some of the European companies versus some of the American companies. Um, but Statoil, who's a Norwegian company, um, has actually created a new unit for renewable energy and is focusing on offshore wind because they've got a lot of capacity in offshore drilling. So offshore wind is a, a very good fit for them. And it's also important not only to think about these um, companies as the producers themselves, so coal, fossil, and natural gas, but also there's a lot of investor engagement around utilities. So getting, for example, companies like Duke Energy or AES or First Energy um, to reduce the amount of coal or fossil fuels in their portfolio and invest in renewables or stop fighting statutes and regulations that allow you to install solar on your homes or to do it uh, for less of a fee to tie into the grid or to get money back through net metering programs. So getting them to stop fighting programs that allow individuals to install distributed generation, that's also a huge piece of, of the work that's being done. So that's not to say that you know there aren't benefit people who are the choice to invest, but it is to say can't be engaged with those companies if you're not invested with them. Regarding a recent New York Times article which said that mutual fund giants Vanguard and Fidelity were resisting shareholder act advocacy initiatives, is the controller or series lobbying these companies to join our efforts? So I can speak a little bit to, to that issue. I'm betting that this was an article that dealt with Vanguard and Fidelity potentially not uh, voting in favor of some of the corporate governance resolutions. Um, and I would say that we are always actively engaged with institutional investors and trying to push them to be active on these issues, uh, especially as they relate to climate change. Uh, Ceres just recently put out a guide for investors um, with BlackRock again another one of the, the big players like that um, and has been pushing uh, with all of the investors that we work with to get them to engage. I, I appreciate the, the question. I think it's uh, you know, an important one to uh, you know, kind of uh, to discuss tonight in terms of where can we have a real impact. Uh, I point out that when, when we put forward shareholder resolutions urging companies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, or when the city of New York this year urged companies to adopt practices that would let us nominate uh, directors going forward, uh, the votes by Fidelity and Vanguard, which could be five to 10% of the vote, uh, where, they, where Fidelity across the board opposed those efforts. Vanguard took a, a meandering approach, uh, but according to our analysis, 
Uh, our resolution is passed at 75% of the companies. Uh, it narrowly fell short of 50% uh, and an additional 15% of the companies. Had either Fidelity or Vanguard voted for those resolutions, they would have passed. So, so yes, uh, we need to engage them. Uh, we're, we're talking to them. They're not of the same mindset quite yet. Uh, but they have significant funds that include retail investors where your retirement savings uh, could be in a Fidelity account, could be in a Vanguard account. Uh, you have, you're in a position to ask them, how are you voting my own shares in these retirement accounts on questions that come up on proxies related to climate change, related to environmental matters, related to disclosing a company's uh, a plan uh, for uh, a sustainable uh, you know, future business strategy on, uh, on proxy access resolutions. Uh, what we'd love to do next year is come back and move that average support level, which was 56, 60 percent, get it to 70 some percent, uh, where, where we'll be going back to companies. So yes, absolutely we're engaging the mutual funds. Uh, we, we would love a big tent approach to that. Uh, and I'm sure that there, there are folks in the room uh, that can actively uh, uh, promote you know, very responsible proxy voting guidelines uh, on this issue as well. So thank you for the question. Yes, uh, I, I'd like to add to that. I think Scott and Shannon have addressed the issue of mutual funds being involved in proxy decisions and proxy votes. At, at Fossil Free Indexes, again, we focused on the Carbon Underground 200 in the database, but that's not the initial purpose of the firm. The purpose of the firm was to propagate fossil free investment alternatives, and in particular, low cost in alternatives that would be available to well, everyone in this room, for example, everyone in the, cli in the climate change. Uh, everyone in the everyone in the climate change movement, everyone who was here on the climate change march, uh, it, we communicated on an ongoing basis over the last year, year and a half, with with the fidelities, state streets, vanguards of the world it, to help make these funds available for individuals. Today, for individuals who want to invest in fossil-free portfolios there's still a something of a premium. You still need to invest in funds which cost more than the low-cost ETFs that are available through Vanguard and through other organizations. And one of the things that you can do is to speak with funds that you're invested in now and encourage them to provide the kind of low-cost investment vehicles for individuals for fossil-free funds that are available for all other funds. In respect to your own portfolio, you may choose to divest your entire portfolio, but at least these funds would give you the ability to invest five or 10 or 20% of your portfolio at, in fossil free funds without paying a significant fund management premium. We certainly have wonderful questions here. I wish we had more time for them. Unfortunately, as I said, we do have to leave. So again, let's thank our wonderful panel again. And again, please stay in touch with us. Everything we're doing at 350 NYC. Thanks for coming tonight.